I personally had an experience of studying abroad. It changed my life. You always have to have your eye on the goal and have the decision that I want to get there. The learning really happens when you're out of your comfort zone. Welcome to Adulting with Joyce Spring. Watch the full video of this episode on my channel, www.youtube.com slash TV. And if you want to level up your adulting game, check out joyspring.com slash collections for my digital products and courses. What's up, you guys? And welcome to another episode of Adulting with Joy Spring. I am your host. I'm the Joy Spring part. I know. I need to change that because since I started this podcast, I got married. I have two kids. And now we're going to be talking about college education because I need to be informed as early as now. We're going to be talking about the importance of educating and education navigating your adulthood and how it will help you prepare for the real world. So if you are a student, an incoming student, a college student, and you want to learn how to be better prepared, what it's like to learn in international settings, and more, I guess, lessons from a doctor, then stick around for this episode of the podcast. We are joined by a guest from Mapua University, Dr. Malaya Santos. Dr. Malaya Pimentel Santos has worked at the intersection of public health, education, and research over the past two and a half decades in various capacities within the academe, public health care system, and non-government sector. As Dean of the Mapua School of Health Sciences, she aims to harness the transformative power of education while highlighting the social determinants of health and the importance of active, immersive, and authentic learning. Hi, Doc Maya. Morning. Very happy to be here. I'm so excited that you're joining us here today. And you were chatting, Kanina, that, you know, this is something new to you, mm -hmm. something that you haven't experienced yes, yet. <laughs> first time, always a first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is not my first time interviewing a doctor, and I have to tell you that I always learn something <laughs> even before Kanina na nag start. I we were already chatting. And today, we are going to be talking about really education, right? And this is something that you have been in for many, many years. Now, you're a teacher as well as a dean, That's and you've right. also been a doctor. Tell me more about your background, Doc, and how you got into this. Um, I am a dermatologist by training. I am not currently practicing. Uh, I have spent the past 15, 20 years in education, research, and uh, public health. So how did I get here? Uh, I have been working for innovation in education. And especially during the pandemic, we really needed to pivot uh, very quickly, learn to use digital tools, and learn to uh, use things that are really outside of our comfort zone. So a lot of this is what brought me to Mapua, which is really at the leading edge of you know digital technology and uh, engineering education. Amazing. And now you are the head of a new arm in Mapua, right? Tell me about that, Doc. That's right. So uh, Mapua has recently opened uh, two uh, schools and in collaboration with uh, Arizona State University. So I represent specifically the School of Health Sciences. So uh, one thing that is new about the School of Health Sciences is that we are not separate schools for nursing, psychology, medical technology, which are the schools that we have currently. Um, but we have them all under one school. So the reason we are doing this is because uh, health practice, health professions practice in the 21st century is not something that we do on our own. It's something that we have to do in a team. And rather than waiting until we graduate to be able to learn to work on a multi-professional healthcare team, we already are able to expose our students to opportunities to learn to collaborate, to work in teams together with the other students also in the School of Health Sciences. Nice. So this is pretty new. Mm -hmm. um, and I think innovative is the right, right part to really explore. We like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a new way to go about things. But I wanted to ask you, Doc, you know, when you go on social media these days, you often see mga TikTok reels or even posts about not important anymore daw to finish college. Mm -hmm. Diba? May mga ganong conversations na hindi mo na kailangan magtapos ng college to be successful in life. What's your opinion on that? How important is it really to finish your education and finish college in the success of another person? So, um, well, we all know it's the age of information and uh, there's so much you can learn on YouTube. Um, you know, learning doesn't just have to be confined to the four walls of the classroom. And we know about, uh, you know, moguls like Steve Jobs and uh, 
Mark Zuckerberg, who actually dropped out of college and are hugely successful. However, when you talk about the health professions, there's really no other way into a career in the health professions other than to finish college. So the short answer to that is that it really depends on what you want to do with your life. But if you want to become, you know, a doctor, a nurse, a medical technologist, uh, or someone in the health professions which are heavily regulated, they're heavily licensed, and there's a good reason for that. Because we handle people's lives, basically. Again, there's really no other way into that career other than to finish college. You know, Doc, that's actually something that has been asked here on the podcast. And I have to tell you that I'm someone that didn't get to finish college, but I feel like, you know, I've, I've found some success in my career. But I always say when I'm asked this question that it is so important to finish your studies, especially if you are aiming to be a professional. And even if you go into a field like this, for example, and you can be successful in broadcasting or journalism or even in digital creation, it's still good to finish your college because there are so many facets, facets of who you are that you can eventually dive into, discover, and explore. And now with the rise of AI, I was reading this article about how the number one job that cannot be taken away are those in health sciences because you can't really put AI to take care of another human being. Physical jobs are so needed for this kind of digital era that we're living in, you know? Yeah, right. Um, but the interesting thing actually about AI is that it can also be a tool. Mm -hmm. So it will not necessarily replace, um, you know, the different professions, but it can make their work easier it can make them uh, give them the ability to serve more patients faster mm -hmm. in a more efficient way so there are really exciting you know digital tools wearables um ai tools for uh doing radiologic examinations you know the x-rays mm -hmm. and to check uh, skin lesions and to be able to diagnose them um preliminarily it's not something that you can you know set set them off and let them on their own mm -hmm. the, the ai tools can't do this on their own but in the hands of somebody who is an expert and Trade get professional. Mm -hmm. yeah, what uh, you get from the AI, then it really opens horizons to be able to serve patients much better and much quicker and, uh, you know, with a lower cost. In yeah, general. definitely. Even in our team, we use AI a lot mm -hmm. for video editing and things like that. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Doc, what is the relevance of getting in-demand courses like health and sciences to have better career opportunities, especially for those young students who are listening in right now? They're not really sure what they want to get into. And I heard this conversation recently where the girl was saying, that, you know, my pamangkin, he was just considering courses that he knew would be lucrative or he can get a job that's in demand after college. Um, yeah, well, every profession is uh, important, of course. But, well, uh, I call my own bias. <laughs> the health profession, especially during the pandemic, uh, we we're really placed front and center. Uh, we, the value of the health professions, um, how much we need them when we get sick, and also to be able to, uh, you know, prevent disease and promote good health. Um, these are roles that our health professionals uh, really play. The other thing actually is that in the health professions, you're not really just doing a job. You're actually, you have to take on, you know, it's a lifelong commitment to a noble profession. And if you're willing to do what it takes to be a good health worker, a doctor, a nurse, medical technologist, psychologist, um, a physical therapist, if you're able to, uh, if you're able and willing to place the needs of your patients ahead of your own, then, you know, the career paths, they, they generally go really well. And the financial reward is not usually something that we talk about, no, as a motivation. But as you can see, there's so many role models of, you know, health professionals that did really good in their lives, um, both, you know, in terms of serving humanity and also in terms of making themselves more comfortable. So in short, there's a huge demand for global health professionals. Uh, they have said that we lack around 90,000 nurses locally. Wow. Yeah. So there's a really high demand talaga for health professionals right now in the Philippines and all over the world. And I think especially because of what's been happening in the past few years, exactly. diba? it's uh, it's really something that's needed right now. And the interesting thing now with Mapua is that you have this collaboration with ASU, Arizona State University. And I think when I heard about this, I was really excited because I personally had an experience of studying abroad and 
it changed my life, honestly. It, it's a whole different experience having classes taught by somebody in the same profession but in a different setting, different culture was really helpful to me. Can you tell me more about this partnership that you have with ASU? Um, so the interesting thing actually about the ASU partnership with Mapua is that it allows several different opportunities to gain um, the study abroad experience. So of course, some of the students can actually go and study abroad in uh, ASU as part of their program in Mapua. So you can physically go to ASU. You can also have an online experience with uh, Arizona State University professors um, studying classes online. And you there are also a lot of opportunities for student exchanges. So the student exchanges can be short-term or long-term. We're talking about a semester or more. Or you can also have like a one- or two-week student exchange and just go there and visit, take a school tour, and get to uh, meet uh, students from all over the world and also get to see the facilities. And, uh, you know, these are different permutations. So, of course, we understand that uh, having to go abroad uh, costs a little bit more. But even for those who don't have the means to actually go abroad, there is also a very international flavor to the education that we give all of our students in the Business and Health Sciences program. Doc, have you studied abroad also? Have you experienced that? Mm -hmm. um, I studied abroad in 2002 to 2004. I took a master's in public health at Tulane University. That's in New Orleans in the U.S. So like you said, it was also similarly life-changing for me. It broadens your horizons. It really opens up new perspectives. Um, not just the from the teachers, but from the classmates. Mm -hmm. Because I was studying public health and global health together with other doctors from you know, from Africa, from South America, and to understand that the health concerns in their settings are the same but also a little bit different. That really opened a lot of, you know, horizons for me. And also that set the trajectory for my career. Because when I came home, I was teaching uh, microbiology from a public health perspective. So giving my own students, you know, the opportunity to learn about the global burden of disease. And so uh, I wasn't just teaching from a Philippine perspective, but I was a Filipino teacher teaching my subject from a more global perspective. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's it's very different when you get to kind of pull yourself out of the usual comfort zone that you're in with learning. And I realized also now that as I'm I'm getting older, the learning really happens when you're out of your comfort zone. When you're out of your comfort zone, when you're trying out something different, when you're with different kinds of people, with different backgrounds, different belief systems, cultures, everything, you kind of are forced to really think on your feet and be so authentically who you are in the path that you're in, right? And and I think you become a better learner just altogether when you're in a setting like that. Absolutely. So if they get into this program they could opt to do the ex student exchange program also in mm -hmm. ASU or they can also just do the online classes that are offered in ASU. Is that correct? Yeah. Like I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the ASU partnership has a lot of different opportunities for students to get an international flavor into their education. So we have what's called a global classroom, which is uh, set up to be able to have uh, an activity that is together with another school or another class that is in another part of the world. It can be in any of the partner universities, and we have 20 partner universities um, around the world in South America, in um, the Middle East, and uh, in, in different parts of Asia. And so you can be sitting in the global classroom with your teacher in the Philippines, and you will be connected digitally with another classroom which has another set of teachers and uh, students in another part of the world. So uh, you get to exchange perspectives even if you're still in the Philippines. So uh, also another way that we get to uh, maximize uh, this partnership is through what we call the repository of content. So uh, it's the digital age, of course, and we uh, can learn uh, you know, at our own pace with uh, materials that have been uploaded into the learning management system. And there's a lot of uh, digital content that is world-class digital content created by uh, ASU professors that is in the repository. So this repository of lectures, videos, assessments, um, all kinds of learning materials and learning objects, this is exclusively available to the Mapua students in business and health sciences. So it's a really exciting 
you know, a treasure trove of uh, content and curricular materials. Yeah, I think that's that's really something that a lot of young students can benefit from, especially now in the digital age. I find that a lot of young people love learning through, as you said, you know, online stuff that they get to access anytime that they have the chance to. Um, but I also know that a career or studying for health sciences and business could be something that could be very challenging for students, Doc. And you've been in this industry for more than, what, two decades now? You've yeah, been teaching about. students. What have you seen in students that help them become successful in this field? Because I know it can be very challenging, right? And if you were to talk to students right now and give them tips on how to be better prepared for getting into college, better prepared into actually finishing this challenging season of their life and becoming successful afterwards, what would you say to them? Mm -hmm. um, there's a term for this. It's called metacognition. Mm -hmm. It's being aware of how you learn best. And I think this particular skill is something that we need to build in ourselves because, you know, there's not just one way to learn. Um, and the best person who would know how we best learn uh, in terms of the pacing, in terms of the type of learning that is most effective for us would be ourselves. So, of course, it's very important to choose the right school, you know, have the right teachers, the right learning facilities, the right curriculum. But regardless of the curriculum and the school that you go to, if you are aware of how you learn best, then this allows you to adapt yourself to be able to succeed in the environment. So I don't know if that was the answer that you were expecting because we usually, you know, have answers like time management and that's very important, you know, and self-discipline. But uh, time management and self-discipline comes more from an awareness of how we learn best. And so that's where I would like to use yeah, that. I, I like that. I like that, uh, that um, advice actually because we always hear the time management and the discipline right. and the accountability partners type of thing. But yeah, medical cognition, is that, how, for example, how you, you learn is visual or auditory? Is that what you're talking about? Partly, yes. But um, the thing about the learning styles is that um, it sometimes gives us the tendency to want to change the learning environment to fit us. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't always happen because we, as learners, we don't have control. And for a school, you can't really adapt to a single learning style because you're teaching a lot of students. So uh, being aware of the learning style that works best for us also gives us the tools to be able to adapt and, uh, you know, adjust to the learning environment that we find ourselves in. Doc, for college students, ang damage and lalo na pag health sciences, ah, wala silang tulog. Dahil they have to learn so much. They have to study so much. They have all these mga on-ground stuff apart from the textbooks. How do you, how would you advise them? Because I know a lot of, wow, this is going to make me sound so old, but I know a lot of my friends who have kids that are getting into college now who are also in health sciences. And one of the struggles that they have is really just finding the energy and the time and sometimes the, the, the determination and the motivation to finish their course because it could be sometimes very challenging. What would be your advice for them as somebody who is finished who became a doctor, who got your master's, and then eventually, you know, you know now you're, you're teaching, you're seeing students. What makes them successful and what makes them finish their school like? Um, for me, it's really the motivation to have the career that you set out to have. Mm -hmm. And uh, you always have to have your eye on the goal and have, you know, uh, you know the decision that I want to get there and that it's going to be worth it in the end. But the other thing that uh, I find, I find, find uh, was effective for me and it's also something that I advise to a lot of my students and mentees over the years, is that you have to be able to also disconnect. Because sometimes when we're trying to work so hard, we reach the point where productivity isn't really that good anymore. But because there's so much to do, you just keep on going. So sometimes when you give yourself that little break, give yourself the, you know, the chance to care for yourself, and self-care can be any anything. It can be you know, from taking a break to having a nice meal. It's different for different people. But to be able to disconnect yourself from that environment of, you know, work, 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 usually will allow you to become more productive in the long run. So again, it's a lot of self-awareness. This is as far as I can go. I need to take a break. 
And then I'll go back and hit the books again once I've recovered. Yeah, that's so important because I feel like the reason why a lot of students and even professionals these days get burnt out is they go to the max before they take a break. Like, I am going to max this out. Pipigain ko yung sarili ko before I even take a break so that I can earn my break Mm -hmm. unless you schedule in your rest and your recuperation. You're really going to get burnt out and really tired. I totally agree. So self-care is something that's really very important and it has to be deliberate. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't wait until you get burnt out or you break down to start caring for yourself. You just have to give yourself that balance of self-care throughout the journey. I love that. Well, you know, a lot of young people who are listening to the podcast right now are still considering what school they'll go to and what to even think about when they're choosing their school and choosing the course that they are going to pursue. So, Doc, what would be the factors that young adults should be considering and prioritizing to ensure that they are making the right choice for their future? You know, I have a best friend who lives in the UK and she would always tell me about their... It's kind of like a leap year for the students there where after you finish high school, you have one year that you can... Like a gap year. Yeah, like a gap year. So you can have one year to just figure it out and, you know, you don't have to apply for college kaagad. But in the Philippines, kasi we don't have that, mm-hmm. right? And so a lot of the students that I get to speak to would often talk about how hard it is to make that life-changing decision of okay, where do I go to school and what course do I pursue? What would be some of the factors that you would give to them that they need to prioritize and think about before choosing their school and the course that they're going to pursue? Mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. And I'm sure a lot of our young, uh, you know, people entering college are considering all of this. So one would be the track record for the school. Uh, You know, you want to look at the school that has a track record for excellence and quality education. Mm -hmm. You want to look at Uh, The faculty, uh, are the faculty experts in their fields? You want to look at the facilities. Is this a facility that will support, uh, you know, my learning in the course that I have chosen? But we also know that students look at other things. They look Mm -hmm. at things like student life. They look at the organizations that are there. Um, They look at the culture of the school. And I think that this is really a very individualized choice. You have to, you know, look at all of those things, the technical aspects, the curriculum, the faculty, the the Um, the facilities, but you also need to try to see if you will imagine yourself being there Mm -hmm. for the next three, four years. And the truth is that school is where we build a lot of lifelong friendships. Uh, We build networks, both personal and professional. So this is not just about what we learn in the classroom, but also about, you know, the the life journey that will uh, set us off into the career path that we want to see ourselves in five to ten years from now. So I would say look uh, short, medium, and long term and try to make a balanced assessment of all of these factors. I should have met Doc when I was 18. That's what I would say. (laughs) No, but it's it's true. You know, it's I when I made this decision um, on on when I was where I was going to school, it was more of like, this is what I wanted. This is the course that I want. The school offers it without really thinking about all of those other things and I didn't know until after I I left school and I started working professionally that those are such important factors that you really have to consider. Now, in the setting of Mapua naman, Doc, how do you think Mapua University really equips their students in preparing them for the real world or for adulthood and to just go out there in the workforce. Yeah, I really like the theme of your podcast, actually adulting, (laughs) which is really preparing people for the real world. And this is something that we have a big commitment to. So Mapua has identified three uh, pillars for success, and that's digital mastery, global readiness, and advanced and immersive facilities. So I can go over these one by one. So why uh, global readiness? Because the world is getting smaller. Uh, you know, digital technology allows us to be linked in space and time to, you know, so many different parts of the world and the country. And it's very important to have that global mindset, that willingness to reach out and collaborate with people from different cultures. So the other one is digital mastery. So we talked a little bit about AI and, you know, how digital technology has really entered into every aspect of our lives. It's in retail, it's in travel, it's in health. And if we don't equip our students with these digital skills to be able to succeed in the 
uh, practice settings of the health professions, then they will have to learn this on their own. So we don't want them to do that. So we have actually integrated a lot of uh, digital activities. So talking about telemedicine, talking about um, uh, electronic health records, and you know the general uses of technology in health. These are all thing, things that are integrated into our curriculum. And the facilities, of course, because learning doesn't happen by accident. So if we want to say we want digital skills and we want global readiness, our facilities have to be advanced and immersive enough to be able to develop these skills. And we have invested a lot of uh, resources into developing these, um, these uh, advanced and immersive facilities. So all in all, our goal is to have practice-ready professionals, you know, not uh, professionals that just learn in the classroom. But we will be giving our students a lot of experiential learning, authentic learning, uh, immersive learning, so that the moment they step out, the moment they graduate, they are already ready to step into the roles of their respective health professions. And we have to admit, the real world is so different yes. from the university, from the classroom. From yeah. the classroom, it's a whole different world. And I think just having those programs is so very helpful to students already. Now, a different aspect to that, Doc Maya, are family members, parents, sisters, brothers, or even just close relatives who are also a part of the student's life. If you were to speak to them right now, how could they best support students who are getting into college, especially in the health sciences, where a lot of the students are getting into just baptism by fire type of thing, where, you know, they want to be doctors, they want to be in the health sciences, and then they go into it, they're so motivated, they're so excited, and then they see the challenges, they get demotivated instantly. How would they support students like that? So uh, our culture, no, the family is really very uh, play a very big part in our lives. So um, I guess you you've already discussed about how the health professions are unique because there are a lot of demands on students while they're still in the academic journey. Because you handle lives, guys. Yes, that's exactly. so important. I yeah. I love my doctor so much. Shout out to Doc DeGrano and Doc Ruth, my uh, my dream team in my in giving birth and having my babies. I just have to say it as a side note because it's so life changing when you have good doctors. Absolutely. And I always say that we have amazing doctors here in the Philippines. I have so much respect, especially for the health professionals, because you just see the dedication that they have for their patients. It's not just about knowledge, as you were talking about earlier. It's this level of compassion that mm -hmm. they have intertwined with the knowledge that they've learned for many, many years of studying and many, many years of, that you guys have really dedicated to becoming better health professionals for those that you will be serving and taking care of. And I always say that there's a lot of challenges because I see so many of my friends who became doctors and so many of my friends' kids who are now studying to be doctors that are just, you know, the dedication has to be there. And you know, the family unit and your support system has to really be big. Yeah, that's so true. And thank you for appreciating. So for the families that, you know, have uh, family members, young family members that want to go into these professions, you have to be ready to support them financially, emotionally, mentally. And, um, you know, be ready for them to have self-doubts at certain times and be ready for them to come to you for advice. And uh, I think the most important thing in this uh, whole uh you know, the, the so family support uh, structure is bi-directional communication. And, uh, and uh, some families are better at that than others. But if you're, you know, you want to support a student to become a health professional, there has to be a deliberate effort to really have bi-directional communication. Um, let let uh, your family member know what they expect from you. Let them know what they need. And just be ready there to support. And sometimes the families are you know, focusing more on the financial aspect. And of course, that's very important. But uh, if we don't support our students emotionally and mentally, then they will be turning to their classmates for the support. And sometimes the classmates are also, you know, in an easy little <laughs> difficult <laughs> situation. So, yeah, it's really, uh, I, I have this saying, it takes, uh, well, it's an African saying, it takes a village to raise a child. So meaning that the community really has to uplift uh, everyone in order to produce uh, a health professional and that's so very true also in in studying to be a health professional so uh, I, we usually say to our students that we are your village um, but uh, in addition to that there's the family members that are the other part of the village that fulfill the roles that as teachers we're not able to fulfill completely so 
tulong-tulong ng talaga. Everybody just has to, you know, give support when it's needed and take a step back when they're okay and, you know, just be there for them. Yeah. Good support system gives you wings. Mm-hmm. That is the reality. If you don't have a good support system, it's really hard to be successful, mm-hmm. especially in yes, a field. Any profession. Yeah, in, any profession. Any in the health science. Yeah, and especially if, if you want to be successful in a difficult field, in mm-hmm. a professional field, right? Um, Doc, as we wind down now the episode, I want to talk about how students can find that balance. I know that you mentioned earlier that a lot of students look for universities not just because of the curriculum or what they can gain academically, but also because of the experiences that they can have. And, you know, when you're in college, it's really a blessing to be able to learn, but at the same time, have real-world experiences. So what would be your advice for students to kind of find that balance between being able to excel or at least survive in your studies while at the same time gaining real-world experiences? Um, So thriving and surviving, hopefully (laughs) thriving, at the very least surviving. Um, Well, in Mapua, for instance, we have actually integrated the real-world experiential learning into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, service learning, uh, which is one, um, which is the term for, you know, having health professionals go into um, health facilities or doing medical missions and providing care even while they are still students. So service learning has three components. It's the service to the community, the learning for the student, and the reflection that ties the two together. So we also have, uh, you know, state-of-the-art uh, simulation equipment. So uh, when when we have, uh, for instance, if you have a doctor or a nurse who's, uh, who's on the healthcare team, sometimes you wonder what it took for them to get there. And we don't want our students in training to go directly to perform procedures on real-life patients. So they have to learn the skills first. And that's why we have a lot of -of state-of-the-art, high-fidelity mannequins and models and task trainers. So a lot of our curriculum is really focused on um, this advanced simulation. And this leads to better preparedness for the student because they can do it over and over um, and extracting blood and giving a, an IV or an intravenous injection. So without, uh, you know, causing harm or tiredness to actual patients, our students are able to do it over and over to really gain that skill. So that's really how we bring in, uh, you know, both the education. This is what ties the classroom to the health facility, this simulation uh, training. Uh, bridges the two uh, very well, I would like to say. Mapua's academic excellence now extends its innovative venture into business and health sciences education. Mapua University's ETU Chenko School of Business and School of Health Sciences in collaboration with Arizona State University, ASU, ranked number one most innovative school in the U.S. by U.S. News and World Report for eight straight years, offers Filipino students access to global education in business and health sciences. This groundbreaking collaboration provides students with a highly differentiated education that is centered on strategies of student success, global immersion, real-world experiential learning, advanced and immersive facilities, and digital mastery. These experiences empower Mapua business and health sciences students and graduates to seamlessly launch their careers at the forefront, whether it's in local or global settings. So, Doc, in closing, there are a lot of young students watching right now. There are also a lot of parents who may be looking at this, figuring out where to send their kids for school because it is a life-changing decision, let's be honest. And even choosing your course in college, I remember that to be the most stressful decision that I made in my young adult life. Um, so what would be your words of encouragement for them? And final advice for those who are still in that in-between stage and those who are already in this field of health sciences. So uh, again, it really boils down to knowing what you want, where you see yourself 5, 10, 15 years from now. And uh, I guess the most important piece of advice for aspiring health sciences students is that uh, you have to be ready to take that oath, the Hippocratic oath, which really starts by, uh, I solemnly swear to devote my life to the service of humanity. And that's really the noble profession that we get into as health professionals. And we talked a lot about, you know, how difficult it is. And I'm not going to lie, it is difficult. 
I'm not going to promise that it is going to be easy, but I promise that if this is what you want in your life, then it's going to be worth it. And that we at Mapua will help you get there and help prepare you with all the skills and the knowledge and, you know, the values to be able to serve patients and populations in the future. So if this is what you want, then go for it and we'll help you get there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Doc Maya, for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yay! What a great conversation and hopefully something that's so encouraging for all the students out there. That's a wrap for today's episode of Adulting with Joy Spring. Remember, education is a key pillar in the realm of adulting. It sets the foundation for personal and professional growth, unlocking numerous possibilities along the way. So invest in yourself, explore new horizons, and make informed decisions to thrive in the real world. Stay tuned for more episodes filled with valuable insights and practical advice. And don't forget to follow Adulting with Joy Spring on your favorite podcast platforms and share this episode with your friends, your fellow college friends, Jujan, who are also navigating the exciting journey of adulthood. Until next time, we'll see you there. Bye. That's it for this episode of Adulting with Joy Spring. If you liked this podcast, please don't forget to use the hashtag Adulting with Joy Spring and also check out www.joyspring.com for the show notes and tag me on social media with you know it at Joy Spring. I'll talk to you guys again soon. Paalam!